Hey, good morning again, church. For those of you who don't know me, I, my name is Josh. I'm the executive pastor here. So if you're visiting, come on back next Sunday. Here, head pastor Scott preaching. We love him and we love the messages that he brings us from the word. Today we get to continue our series, That's Why He Came, the Ministries of Jesus, uh, spoken out of, proclaimed out of Luke 4. Two weeks ago, Pastor Scott talked about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And if you're here for that, there was something special, the way the Spirit moved. There was just this hunger that rose up in the church, and the altars were just packed full at the end. And I've been praying that the Holy Spirit is continuing to, to stir that hunger up in you. And if you missed that message, I encourage you to go back and listen to it, uh, because there was something special that God did in this church that day. Last week, Jeremy, who's just up here, our next-gen pastor, gave us a message also from Luke 4 on the proclamation of the good news for the poor. And that proclamation, the good news, is salvation. The poor, those who haven't yet met Jesus. There were great scriptures there, just an outline of scripture of what it takes, what, what the journey to salvation. And if you're trying to, to gather ideas, scriptures, words, for how to talk to your neighbor, um, the Lord will inspire you through the Holy Spirit, but he laid out some great scripture last week for that purpose. So if you're struggling to, to what scriptures do I use, what words do I use, um, check that message out. So today, we're going to continue in Luke 4, 18 and 19, and we're going to move on to the next phrase. And the title of the message today is, That's Why He Came, He Came to Set Us Free. So let's jump back in and look at Luke 4, 18 and 19 real quickly. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Today we're going to key in on to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, or in some texts, to set the captives free, and to set the oppressed free. We're going to focus in on spiritual and emotional healing. And next week, Scott is going to continue right overlapping those verses with physical healing because there's truth there to physical healing too. But today, we're going to focus more on the spiritual and emotional um, relief that the Holy Spirit, that God provides us from life's problems. I want to establish just a couple of things from Isaiah 61 because when Jesus comes in, he's quoting Isaiah 61. He's not just uh, saying his own words. He's pulling down this prophecy, this scripture, this uh, text um, in his local church, the tabernacle. And he opens up to these very specific words to read. Um, what you see on the screen, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. So a couple of things to understand about uh, the original text is Isaiah was prophesying to a people who'd been captive over and over again, right? Right? <laughs> They were, they were being warned about captivity with the Babylonians. They'd been captive to the Assyrians, the, the Chaldeans. And uh, when Jesus reads this, they're actually occupied by Rome. I mean, they've been captive over and over again. And so um, he's talking uh, about captivity to those who knew captivity well. And that word captivity in this text actually means to be a prisoner of war or to be taken by spear. Now, I'm guessing most of you here haven't been taken by spear. <laughs> I know one or two of you may have experienced some kind of physical captivity, um, but there's, there's something more going on in this text. But they understood captivity well. The second thing I want us to understand is from Isaiah 61, the year of the Lord's favor, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's actually a reference to the year of Jubilee. Now, this is a cool thing. When I said that there was, there was proclamation and prophecy in our worship today, Ashton comes to me with, with the worship set made and I hadn't even shared the text with her. And, and what do you know? There's the year of Jubilee. That's how God works. He puts things together so that we can, we can get to Scripture. We understand it through song and through multiple means. But this year of Jubilee was a 50th year. Day one of the 50 years was the Day of Atonement, the being made one through sacrifice, through forgiveness, at one minute. The Day of Atonement started the 50-year cycle. And every seven years was a year of rest. If you study the Old Testament, this is pretty common knowledge. But this 50th year then, right, this year of Jubilee, was a special year of the Lord's favor, a year of feasts, a year of rest, 
A year when if you had been sold into slavery, you were set free. A year when if you had had to sell off property to pay a debt, the property was actually returned to you. I mean, I could go for a year of Jubilee right now, huh? <laughs> I could, I could, I would, a year of rest? A whole year of, I mean, it, okay, year of Jubilee. But he's talking to those who knew captivity well, and he's proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, a year of Jubilee. Now, he's proclaiming to God's people, the Israelites, freedom. And it begs the question, can God's people be captive? Can God's people be captive? Well, obviously the Israelites have been taken physically captive time and time again. But the question that we need to search out today is, do we have to be wary of captivity? And to answer that, we're going to go to John. We're going to go to John 8, starting in verse 31 to 34. This is Jesus speaking. So Jesus said to the Jews... Who had believed him, I want you to hold that thought, it's an important one. The Jews who had believed him. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, the Jews who believed him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. But there's a couple of you that already got it. We've never been enslaved to anyone. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Chaldeans. You go back to when they first went down to Egypt. They were under slavery. Moses had to walk them through freedom. And they're under Roman occupation. We've never been slaves to anyone. We've not been captive. So what's going on? There's some serious denial going on. Some serious blinding. Let's pray against that for ourselves today. That our eyes not be blinded to the areas where we're still captive, where Jesus wants to set us free. So these were Jews who believed him, and he's speaking this. And what's Jesus' response then? Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus had answered them. So, I want to look at verb tenses real quickly here. English teachers, you can enjoy this, this phrase. But uh, some of you know my educational background, and I was not uh, a good English teacher. But there's, there's some truth in these verbs here that we need to understand. Okay? So first, the word abide. The word abide. He says, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Note that that word abide has connotations of dwelling with, of being with, even to stand with. It's a process. It's not like I just, I step in and I step out and I'm done. It's a process. If you abide in my word, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you live with my word, if you are faithful to my word, do you see that this is a process? It's not like just stepping in. It's like a living out. It's continually getting to know. If you abide, then the, you will know the truth, and the truth will set. That's a future tense. Will set you free. We come to know Jesus in salvation, but then he continues to set us free as we know more and more of him, his spirit, his word. Hebrews 10.14 says this. For by a single offering, what's the offering? His death on the cross, his sacrificial death. By a single offering, he has perfected, past tense, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The moment we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, we're saved and we're perfected. Praise God. Praise God, not my righteousness, but his upon me. He's perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That's as we are growing closer and closer to him. We are dwelling with him. We're abiding in him. We're knowing the truth. And the truth sets us more and more free. Likewise, 
we're warned about practicing sin. So let's just talk real quickly about practice. Practice is getting ready for something, right? We've got instrumentals in here. You practice for a concert. You practice those lines, those notes, that, that music over and over again. You practice with intentionality and preparation. Those of you who are athletes, you practice. You run certain plays to get ready for a football game. You run certain plays to get ready for a basketball game. But you practice with intentionality. You don't practice one time and then you're done. You practice with intentionality. So think about practice here. He who practices sin. The Lord knows that we're we're human and and we're going to struggle at times. And he's going to continue to work that out. But he perfected us. The moment of salvation. But we're being sanctified. So, we can abide with him, know the truth, the truth will set us free. Or, we can practice sin. Isn't that a little scary when it's put like that, like with intentionality, that we're practicing sin? That's what we're really being warned about here. He who practices sin is a slave to sin. Again, as someone in education, I enjoy research, but I know that true truth is found in Scripture alone. Amen? But then I'm humored how science and research continue to finally catch up with Scripture. They will, if they haven't, but Scripture, the Bible, is truth. As I've read several books this fall, there's this word that keeps coming up over and over again. It's this word neuroplasticity. Say it with me, neuroplasticity. Awesome. So some of you have read about this. You enjoyed it. I know one of our life groups even read a book that that talks a lot about this topic, but neuroplasticity. So neuro meaning our neural systems, our mind, and plasticity meaning moldable. Like, can you do this? We're moldable? Okay. Not the 90s dance moves. Sorry. Like, look at that. But our minds can be molded and shaped. God made us that way. Praise God. We're not stuck in a rut. It's easy to say, I dealt with anger as a kid. I'm still kind of an angry person. and I'll probably always deal with anger. That's a lie. The truth of Scripture is neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You can be transformed. You can be changed. And as you're transformed, then by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Yes, God gave us each proclivities, certain tendencies for certain things that we have to be aware of. But if there's sin in your life, whether it's sexual temptation or gossip, I mean, you talk about anything in the range. God gave us this gift of neuroplasticity, and he gave us the power of the Spirit, which can transform us. As you abide in me, you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. One of those books I want to reference real quickly that I've been reading this fall is by Linda Seiler, Dr. Linda Seiler, actually. She has a uh, doctorate from the Assemblies of God Seminary, and she's been here. We've supported her work. Um, She's also a a key um, missionary to Chi Alpha, but her book came out this fall, and this is, a, this is the book, this is the title, Transformation, a former transgender responds to LGBTQ. Praise God, a former. Where society would say that certain things are identity, the truth of Scripture says our identity is moldable. We can be transformed by the renewing of our minds as we abide with truth. The truth can set us free. Linda walked that journey. If you were here and heard her speak, she dealt with, with all sorts of, of temptation and struggle for years, years. But as she came to know the truth of Scripture and let Jesus transform her, she was radically changed. And so from her study of Scripture, her doctorate, from her life experience, she talks about change with these three steps. And I'll quote, For the overcomer, this looks like repenting for acting out, renewing the mind with Scripture, and embracing our identity in Christ as a dearly loved child created by God. As we persist, remember that sanctification, that working out, as we persist, 
we begin to experience desires that align with the new self, with the identity he gives us. This comes right out of Ephesians 4, 22 and 24. This isn't just Linda speaking. We always, again, want to, how does this align with Scripture? Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. Put off your old self, repent. That belongs to your former manner of life, and it's corrupt through deceitful desires. Desires that, things that are in us that we think are going to make us happy, think that are right, but our emotions can be deceitful. <laughs> Put off the corruption, deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God. We abide with him, we know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Sometimes that's in an instant. I know there are people in this congregation, when you came to know Christ, he freed you from something overnight. Praise God. Praise God. He does it. But for most of us, he works through sanctification. That over time, he works those things out in our life. And if you're looking for freedom, you keep praying, Lord God, I want to be free now. Let that be the cry of our heart. But don't fight the process too because he's teaching us through the process. We're abiding in him and we're being sanctified. We're being set free. He gives us this two ways, right? He gives us this neuroplastic mind that is moldable and shapeable. And he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit once we're saved to work that out in us. The truth will set you free. I can't make my own freedom. I can abide with him. I can dwell with the truth but it's the truth that sets us free. Some of you, as we've looked at these scriptures, there's already freedom that you're searching for in your life. For others of us, sometimes, I may have to go with a regular mic. This thing does not fit me like it fits some others. Um, forgive me. If you can't hear me, just shout out and I'll, I'll switch over. Um, as, as we, um, some of us, we get stuck in ruts, right? And do we even understand our own captivity sometimes? So let's, let's just push some buttons today. Let's look at captivity in the New Testament. And that word captive in Luke 4 is found a couple other places in the New Testament. That taken by spear, that prisoner of war, that word is found in Romans 7, 6. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code, having died to that which held us captive. So the law can hold us captive? What does that look like? It's legalism. It's legalism. I've been in, in Bible study with some of you that talked about religious traditions you came from, where it was always trying to do enough, always trying to earn your way to salvation. That's what you grew up with. I'm not sure if I can be saved... Some, some might consider that prideful from certain traditions, but the truth, the truth is that our salvation is secure. Jesus died to make that happen. So it's not this working out, it's not this doing enough. That's legalism. It means you're, you're always scared to, to cross the line or, or not to do the right thing, but he gives us freedom. Instead, the truth of Christianity, and this is what separates Christianity from other religions, right? There's a lot of religions that say do good. And it looks like it's truth, but it's not. Because truth is, Jesus died, he saved us, and as a result of obedience of love, we respond. You see the difference? It's not trying to walk this line of obedience. It's, Lord, thank you for what you did. Now I can't wait to serve you. I think of it like this with speed limits. It's, it's an easy target, but I'm guilty too, so I'm just going to go there. Speed limits, right? I'm driving along a four-lane highway with a sign that says speed limit 55, and some of you are like, speed limit? Okay, I'm going to walk that line. <laughs> Maybe you fight legalism. Uh, that's not what I fight. <laughs> I'm looking around, four-lane highway? Nobody's here? 55? Well, that's kind of dumb. Um, and in you, there can be this stirring of, eh, not a big deal. For some of us, there can be this like little rebelliousness in us, like, well, who are they to say? Government. 
Um, <laughs> whatever. We have to check ourselves. Others of us are like 55. I know I can do at least twice that. Um, no, okay, okay. The old me. I put that self off, okay? But now here's the difference. The speed limit sign doesn't get me to do what relationship might. Because when I'm driving home and I'm getting towards my own neighborhood where my own kids are out playing, our dog's in the yard, where my neighbor's kids are out playing, all of a sudden it's not about the speed limit, it's about protecting those I love. It's about responding to relationship. Do you see this truth? Legalism holds us captive. But the grace of Jesus, the love of Jesus says, you're free. And out of gratitude, as obedience is worship, we respond and say, Lord, I'm happy to because I can't even begin to match what you already did for me on the cross. And so I respond in love and obedience. Freedom. Freedom. As we know the truth, the truth sets us free to a whole new way of thinking. Captiv- captivity is also mentioned in Colossians 2.8. We're going to read that. Again, same verb, captive, captivity, that's in Luke 4. See to it that no one takes you captive. You have to be aware. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So this one breaks down into three parts. And the first one we see is philosophy. Philosophy. Now, if you study this, Paul, and some of you just can look down in your footnotes, it's, it, it's right there, but the philosophy Paul's talking about isn't all philosophy. He's talking about philosophy that specifically contradicts Scripture. There's lots of interesting teaching out there that's also consistent with Scripture. And if that's where you're at, great. But as we look at philosophy, Paul is saying, you need to be very wary that the truth is found in Scripture, the truth is found in Jesus Christ, And the other philosophies you're reading, let them not pull you aside. There are all sorts of arenas where we can talk about this. Business business, uh, and leadership materials, that's, that's an area I like to read. Some of it teaches servant leadership. The example we showed that we, we saw acted out in the life of Jesus. But then there's other that just talks about high and lofty goals, trying to achieve something. Have to be wary of this in counseling. There are many great biblical, godly counselors who counsel with the word of God, who counsel with biblical principles. But there's also, and I've seen this coming from education, where it's just more of this feel good. Like deal with your problems and, and, and kind of Make it, make it work. Make it feel good. Truth of Scripture. As I was, as I was thinking, probably more along the lines of this philosophy stuff, uh, I, was, I was wrapping up message preparation on Thursday, and, and God told me it was almost done. Almost as scary. But as, as I'm now in my personal devotions Friday morning, my day off, this, this verse just jumps off the page at me that I thought, wow, there's, there's an interesting connection there. I don't believe this one will be up on the screen because it came Friday morning, but when we talk about empty philosophy, deceitful desires, go here with me. 1 John 2.16. 1 John 2.16. You can write that down and, and look it up later for yourself or you can turn there, but 1 John 2.16. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in achievements and possessions. Man, achievements, it, it seems like the right thing to pursue. And I'm not saying it's bad, but, but let's look at the scripture. And pride in achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. Man, that one struck me. That one struck me. Now, a lot of you, like me, are geared towards certain achievements. You want to you be successful. And it's not that it's saying that success or achievements or possessions inherently are bad. But where's our heart on those things? Let me give you a little illustration. So, some of you know that I am uh, a big disc golf fan, and some of you don't even understand what the sport is. And that's fine. It doesn't matter for the illustration. But one of, one of my hobbies is to go play disc golf. And so... Um, 
like golf clubs, each one of these little discs is a little different. Some people are good enough that each one actually does something different. For some of us, well, <laughs> you can buy lots and they all seem to do the same thing. So, my heart on this. You buy a couple discs, it's fun. And, and the reason I love the hobby is I can be out in the woods, I can be out in nature, I can walk, play the sport and pray, I can walk, fellowship with, with brothers in Christ. It's a beautiful thing. That's a good heart of it. The other heart of this I see is, oh, well, that one looks cool, that one flies pretty well, and so I've got to get something to, to hold it with, and so, you know, you, you get your first bag, and it holds a few discs in there, and maybe a water bottle, and that's pretty easy to carry. It's pretty easy to carry. Well, then, you think you need a few more discs, and, and you kind of like them, so you buy some more, and then pretty soon you need a backpack. And, and there's a whole bunch in there. <laughs> and, 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 you know, your bug spray, because you're out in the woods, and your water bottle, and usually I've got a stick in here to pull them out of the tree, because that's where they go. <laughs> and, you know, it... There's a little weight difference as I accumulate possessions. And, and then I fall even further in love with the hobby, and I got to buy myself one of these. And, <laughs> and you, put, you put a radio in it, and you put a little seat on top because you, you get tired of walking. And then if the hobby turns into full-blown sin, it might look like something like this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a joke. Me, me and Jeremy like to have this like button pushing because he likes golf and I'd rather go play disc golf. So we, we push each other's buttons. That one's there um, for some of you golfers. Again, it's not the hobby. It's the love of possessions. It's the de desire for achievement over what God wants in my life. And it's easy to laugh about these things. But when we look in Scripture, we need to be pretty careful that those aren't taking God's place in our life. Next in Colossians, we see that tradition can take us captive, according to human tradition. Now, if you're like me, there are certain traditions you really like. I mean, every Christmas, we get out the Christmas ornaments, and we, we start unboxing. And each of the ornaments is from a vacation we went on to, a, at a, something that the kids have done in their lives, and we retell the story of the years of our family as we unbox the Christmas ornaments. It's a beautiful tradition. We make certain cookies getting ready for Christmas. Um, every year at my mom's house, we make these anise cookies that have this, this uh, black licorice tasting oil in them. And we only eat them once a year. Some of you are like, mmm. Some of you are like, ugh. <laughs> and, and, you know, once a year is kind of enough, but it's a, tradi a tradition. And every summer, our family takes the same vacation, and we go to the same place, uh, partially because we're cheap, and it's a, it's a discounted, I mean, it's a good deal, but we love it. We know people there, and we go to the same camp every year, and we make uh, cookies. We make these waffle turtle cookies. They're chocolate cookies made in the waffle iron with chocolate frosting. Um, we make, my wife makes biscotti, this like twice-baked bread with lemon flavoring and white chocolate uh, bark on top, and... Now, as I'm saying this, I'm starting to realize we've got a cookie problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I like my routines and my traditions. Every morning, I've got a routine that's, well, my family makes fun of me for it because it's so, I'm such a person of routine. But the challenge here is we become, again, so stuck in a rut that we start ignoring what God is calling us to. What freedoms? You know, as we're, as we're nearing a lot of those family gatherings, let me, let me push a button. When we're gathering together out of tradition, is it a tradition full of connection and fellowship and prayer? Or is it a connection full of whining and gossiping and drunkenness and wh whatever else? Tradition doesn't make it okay. And remember... Uh, we, can, we can talk about gluttony, right? Thanksgiving just happened, and you get up, and you have your, your souffle for breakfast, and then you have your turkey meal for lunch, and then you have your turkey soup for supper, and then fourth meal comes around. you got to get the stretchy pants out, and you, 
you're ready for your turkey sandwich. Now, we're not talking about a one-time thing. There were feasts in the Old Testament, right? But whether it's gluttony or drunkenness or anything else, what's the practice? We need to be careful that those practices, we don't open the door to practices. Because when we practice sin, over and over again, we become slaves to sin. And that's what we're warned about. Guys, for us, some of it may be, maybe, you know, traditions of going out to a game together. And you go with brothers in Christ, great. You go with brothers who aren't. Crude joking and other things start to slip in. We need to watch our traditions. Ladies, you know those circles of friends, and I'm not even going to go there because I'm not a lady. But I just offered up, when you're out with your circle of friends, is it God honoring? Or are there things that really need to be worked out there? We already looked at John 8, 34. Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. But verse 35 goes on. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. The son. Now sometimes in scripture, son is capitalized, meaning it's Jesus. But this, in this case, it's not. The son. This is him calling us, his children, his sons and daughters. When we abide in him, We know the truth, the truth will set us free. We're declared his sons and daughters. But when we continually practice sin, for whatever reason, tradition, empty philosophy, deceit, well, the slave does not remain in the house forever. And that's a dire warning for us. The third captivity that Paul warns us about in Colossians are elemental spirits of the world. This is likely talking about demonic activity. And let me proclaim a truth real quickly. Light and dark don't coexist. When you're saved and the Holy Spirit comes in you, you're not possessed. But we've already established that that you can be oppressed. What's the truth of Ephesians? We fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and darkness. We need to be wary of what we open our hearts to through different aspects of our life. We see this Um, this principle in the life of Saul, King Saul. King Saul, God's anointed one. He was chosen by God to lead the people as the first king of Israel. He was anointed by Samuel the prophet. But very quickly, we see in his life pride start to creep in. We see selfishness, maybe even the worry of what others think creep in. And he starts to violate the commands that Samuel's given him. And eventually, he starts to offer sacrifices that were not ordered up. They were not not what God had for him. And so Samuel comes to rebuke Saul in 1 Samuel 15. And I want to look at this scripture real quickly. And there is a connection between the elemental spirits. We'll get there. 1 Samuel 15 Verses 22 and 23. Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? The sacrifices, the things you give, they're not, they're not as important as, as obedience. Obedience is worship. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen, insert is better than, and to listen is better than the fat of rams. When you see parallels in scripture to obey and to listen, those parallels It's a point of emphasis. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Now check this. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. And this is Samuel speaking to Saul. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, you made the first move. Because you rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. The New King James Version actually translates this phrase, for the rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Hmm. So the warning here, again, we established, it's not that you're possessed, but when we're in open rebellion against God, we open our doors to to some real evil. And that's what I challenge you to reflect on. Is there a sin that you know God is calling you to move beyond? Is there someone that God has called you to forgive and bitterness and pride are holding you from doing that? 
Is there that rebellion in you? Is there an obedience? There's sins of commission, something we act out, and there's sins of omission, where God's called us to do something, we're saying no. Someone I'm being called to reach, something I'm being called to do. I'm not saying that that's there for each one of us, but that's what I'm saying you need to reflect on, because rebellion against what God is calling us to do opens us up to darkness that we don't want to have any part of. We talked about abiding and practicing. The truth of the matter is, it's really hard to abide in truth and practice sin at the same time. And there might be a season of your life where you've experienced that. I mean, there, there were times in my life where God had to, had to just pull some things out, rip some things out. And when you're honestly trying to follow God and there's still sin being worked out, it is painful. It is painful. But he wants you to find freedom because he loves you. He loves you. May we all be wary of captivity, whether that's through tradition or false teaching, sin. May we all be wary. But the truth, the truth that Jesus came to proclaim is freedom. John 8, 31 and 32 again. If you abide in my word... You are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 again. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Is there a deceitful desire in your life that he's trying to work out? It's corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds to put on the new self created after the likeness of God. And one more I want to add in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, we, we acknowledge the glory of God as we come to him, we acknowledge the glory of God, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image. Whose image? God's image. Isn't that humbling? We are being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another. Praise God. Praise God that I am saved. He sees me as as a son and daughter as perfect, but he knows I still have the journey and his grace is good enough to walk me through that practice, that that sanctification throughout my life. And and I know you've heard this before, but if if I'm still walking, he's not done working, right? right? He's still working things out in me, it doesn't matter. From, from youngest to oldest in this room, he's still working on us. Scripture gives us the road to freedom. We abide with God in prayer, in worship, and obedience, in his presence and in his word. We know his truth, and it changes us from the inside out. We take on the new self, the identity of a child of God. In faith, we start that journey, knowing that it's gonna, it might take time. But in faith, we know he will sanctify us, release us, from oppression and the truth will set us free. Amen? Amen. Amen. Worship team, would you come forward? So what's our response to this? It's not really that complicated. Where do I, where do you need freedom? Where do we need freedom? God's still sanctifying us. There's probably something he's still working out in us. As I'm studying, I'm like, okay, God, (laughs) okay. But I also don't want to dismiss the importance of this. The truth is he's always going to be working something out, but there is some urgency. Remember from the very beginning of this message, we read Luke 4, and we talked about how Jesus was quoting Isaiah 61. Well, as he's quoting Isaiah 61, he stopped at a really interesting point. So let's go back to Isaiah 61 and read this real quickly. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, salvation. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, praise God, and the day of vengeance of our God. So why did he stop? Why didn't he finish reading the scroll? 
because today is the day of salvation. Today, today he proclaims freedom for the captives. Today he moves us to a life of freedom. But the truth of scripture is that a day of judgment, a day of vengeance is still coming. He wills that none of us should perish, but that all come to salvation. And he's still working things out in all of us. So if you've already got this, you've already got that area of freedom, you're ready to pray, praise God. If you're like, I can put it off, we don't know when that day is coming, but we're called to be ready whenever that day is. Jesus came to proclaim freedom. The kingdom of God is here. And as we abide with him, we can be made free.